in the world of before, uh, that seems so long ago now, um, amongst many things that I used to enjoy, look forward to, was the Oscars, the <laughs> the um, the awards ceremony in Hollywood. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I had a background in going to the cinema. As a, from as, from before a time when I can remember, really, my, my, as a child, I was taken to the cinema in Dumfries uh, by my mum and dad, and I, I think there were there must have been patches where we went every week if there was a good film to see, and you know, and there often were purple patches where there was one good film after another. Anyway, I, I grew up. Uh, I was old enough to go to the cinema on my own, and I can I continued to have it. Went all the time, and then when I met Trudy. Uh, my my girlfriend then, my wife now, uh, when we met at Glasgow Uni, going to the cinema was a big part of what we did together. We had a, a, a two-screen cinema, a, a two-minute walk from my flat on uh, Rutherford Street in the west end of Glasgow. It was called The Grosvenor. And, and sometimes we'd go and see more than one movie a week, yeah, more than two movies a week. And then, we, you know, we had kids and we took our own kids from the beginning. We used to go to a thing called The Scream Club at the local cinema in Stirling that allowed you in with your uh, crying infants. <laughs> there was just an understanding that if somebody's, or if multiple kids started wailing, as babies sometimes do, then you just had to put up with it. And then as they got older, uh, you're going to the cinema became a regular feature of our week, our weekends, and we saw every animated feature going. And um, then we saw all the Marvel stuff, uh, you know, the Avengers and all of that, you, you know, decades. And through all of it, through all those decades, I always paid attention to the Oscars. So did Trudy. Yeah, I, I, we, it was a t big talking point. And for the longest time, I think probably there was a high point for, for us in the 90s and early 2000s, would would get properly caught up in it. We didn't watch sport or any like Olympics or the World Cup, never did anything for Trudy or I. So our equivalent was, was the Oscars and, and wondering who would win that. It's hard to believe it now. <laughs> like I say, trivia, trivial, inconsequential, but, but, but there you are. Um, and in those days, I would always have seen a lot of the contenders for the awards. Sometimes I'd seen every single one of them. You know, I'd, sometimes I could, you know, I would, I would, I would know what they were talking about. I would look forward to the clips and all of it. And and I remember clearly when when there were, and it was happened all the time when there were real head to head contest contests for the best film. You know, the uh, Titanic against L.A. Confidential and uh, Saving Private Ryan up against Shakespeare in Love and Braveheart up against Sense and Sensibility and Apollo 13, all, all at the same time. And I remember 1999, that was a particularly uh, rich vein. The Sixth Sense, The Matrix, you know, the first one, The Talented Mr. Ripley, Fight Club, Three Kings... The Insider, and I had seen them all at the cinema. And there was a time, heaven help me, when I used to listen to the acceptance speeches. <laughs> and sometimes I actually thought the actors meant what they said, that they were saying something they actually thought. And that, I mean, that's, now I reckon it's, all, it's written for them by chat GPT and run through an algorithm to see if whatever they're going to say meets the needs of the prevailing ideology. But there's nothing new, obviously, about running down the movies in Hollywood. You know, I'm I'm old enough to remember, you know, the advent of VHS video and 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 all the rest of it, where people said, "Oh well, that's it now, no more cinema." And and also, you know, I, I, I've seen it, I've seen them come and seen them go. People bemoaning the lack of quality and depth and all of the rest of it. Uh, people predicting the end of Hollywood, but but it's not new. Um, you know, Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard, 1950, you know, has a scene where there's a the struggling screenwriter, Joe Gillis, who's played by Hollywood legend William Holden. He bumps in, in a mansion, seen in a mansion, he bumps into faded movie star Norma Desmond, who's played by another legend, Gloria Swanson. And he says, you're Norma Desmond. You used to be in silent pictures. You used to be big. And she says, I am big. It's the pictures that got small. It's, you know, it's, it's always been the case that cinema was about to come to an end, and and it, it maybe maybe it's a, a small thing uh, revealing about my true nature that you know to be bothering about the movies just now and the Oscars a time like this with everything else that's going on in the world, you know, maybe. 
But I'm not so sure. I think maybe it does matter. I think sometimes truth is revealed in, in unlikely places or something worth paying attention to at least. And, you know, my, my family's, and it is decades long, decades long closeness with the cinema. It ended with lockdown. Uh, you know, when all the cinemas closed, obviously, shut down on the grounds of all that nonsense. Save the NHS and all that stuff. Um, and by the time they reopened, something else had changed as well. And it was, I don't know what had happened to the movie industry. I don't know. There was a writer's strike as well. And, and there were all sorts of contributory um, factors and an actor's strike. There was all sorts of strife going on. But in any event, one way or another, the movies that, that were available in the in the immediate aftermath, they, they, they were just stuff we didn't want to see. It, it was like something, it was like some, something had come to an end an end of an era and another another era of film had started our kids still go because we've we've given them the bug we've infected them with it and they still go but too often my daughter will come home and say whatever it was was rubbish and, and, and increasingly she characterises it as woke drivel she's wise to it you know she sees the she sees the nudge and the you know and the the, the behavioural manipulation that, that's woven into an awful lot of it that's out there and you know, Trudy and I do go and see the occasional film, or we go as a family when something comes. You know, we went, we all went to see Top Gun Maverick, you know, the the reboot of of Top Gun, and I loved it. I love I love um, uh, uh, Mission Impossible as well. I I think I think um, Tom Cruise films are that's like reggae like it used to be. You know, it's like he still he still knocks out movies that that still look and feel like movies to me. Um. And last week, just last week, I went to see Dune Part 2 with with one of my boys. And we enjoyed it so much that we're going again uh, tonight, actually, after school. Um, and, and this time, my, my eldest boy's coming too. He's intrigued. But that, those experiences are few and far between now. And then at the weekend, it was the Oscars again. And, and not for the, I mean, not for years have we watched it. And I don't know what the viewing figures were like this year, but they always seem to be fighting a losing battle. Nothing like the audiences that it used to get. It used to dominate. It used to be something that everyone stayed in to watch, but not for the longest time. Um, and in, in and around it, the coverage of it, um, apparently we're looking at the death of woke. You know, there are people predicting that, that Hollywood is dying the death of a thousand woke cuts, that... The, the preaching within the, within the movies is, is is bleeding them to death. So they say, now I'm not sure that it's that easy to kill woke. Um, I think woke will never die. <laughs> It'll just come back in a different outfit. But to me, it looks more as though everyone concerned, celebs, the audience in the theatre uh, and the industry behind it, all, finally the whole lot of them have lost track of which way's up. The whole bollocks nature of the bollocks means that finally none of them can keep up with it anymore. You can see it. They don't know which way they're supposed to be saluting. You know, for a while there, the thing that is woke had an identity of sorts, something coherent. You know, it was bollocks, but it was coherent bollocks. Um, you know, obviously from my perspective, woke was always and only bollocks. Uh, especially, you know, the, that diarrhea concept that that had, you know, that they're still pushing that actors have to be the thing before they're allowed to act the thing. You know, so only trans actors can play the part of trans, and, and only an actor with a specific disability, mental or physical, is allowed to act the disability. Um, and 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 well, you know, like obviously black actors or people of color can play roles previously ascribed to white people. White actors can only act white. And female actors can take male, traditionally male roles, but male actors can't take female roles. Well, they could if they identified as trans, obviously. But I say, so it's bollocks all the way down. Diversity, equity and inclusivity, the dread acronym that is DEI, that, that, that's metastasized, metastasized cancer. And it's got into the movies along with everything else. And it's almost fun to watch. You, you, looking on at the clips at the Oscars, you know, where they go from the award to the audience, you know, the, the, you know and the, you could see the, the, the evident headless chicken running about 
that was there in the celebs' behaviour. You're clapping this, cheering that, and but not knowing whether they should or not. And, and if they were clapping, they weren't sure why. Yeah, it's like a plot twist in a movie, you, you might say. You know, oh, I mean, for example, all that time, you know, pr- you know, pretending to be the good guys, all that preaching to us lesser mortals about this cause or that, all of that reading from the right script written by the right sort of people. Yeah, and, and then then in amongst all the Trump jokes and the back slapping, you know, along comes Jonathan Glazer. He's a, a, the Jewish director of The Zone of Interest, which was the movie that got the gong this year for Best International Film. And it's about complicity in the context of the everyday lives led by a, a, a Nazi family living next door to the Auschwitz death camp, concentration camp. And Glazer used his acceptance speech to condemn Israel's occupation. Occupation was his word, not mine, uh, just for clarity, of the Palestinian territory and its attacks on Gaza, as well, as well, I mean, he was condemning as well the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. And he said, our film shows where dehumanisation leads at its worst. Right now we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people, whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza. All the victims, this dehumanisation, how do we resist? And, you know, and the, the Oscars, the, cl- the crowd clapped as well they might, but no doubt wondering while they were clapping whether they should be clapping or not, you know, wh- worrying whether or not they'd been given the right direction. And and then there was the in memoriam section, you know that bit where they show you all the all the actors and other you know luminaries, directors and people who've died in the year just past. And this year it was introduced in the Russian language, and there was a clip of Alexei Navalny, you know the anti-Putin dissident who died in a Russian jail, and and, and you know and despite you know the photos of him appearing alongside swastikas and and the fact that he was never a contender for Putin's throne. He, he, He's been hailed as a as a martyr and as the best president Russia never had. And, and on the big screen, he was associated with the old line that reads, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And the crowd clapped again. And then there was um, a Ukrainian director, Mtislav Chernov, I apologise for the pronunciation. Uh, he, he collected the Oscar for documentary feature documentary feature film for 20 Days in Mariupol. Uh, and he said that while he was honoured by the award, uh, he said, but probably he was the first director on the stage who will say, I wish I'd never made this film. I wish to be able to exchange this to Russia, never attacking Ukraine, never occupying our cities, not killing tens of thousands of my fellow Ukrainians. But I cannot change history. I cannot change the past. And the crowd clapped and cheered again. You know, with everything that's going on in the wider world, so much that we've had revealed to us. The pantomime of the Oscars this year felt especially hard to swallow. You know, Ukraine, despite the lies about defending democracy, the blatant profiteering, the sacrifice of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians on an altar raised to NATO, the Pentagon, the CIA, Wall Street, the White House, the Palace of Westminster, the City of London, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, you know, all the constituent parts of the military industrial complex, and, you know, and then, in, you know, in, in the Holy Land, despite the plausible genocide in Gaza, you, the show must go on and does go on, you know. So Chernov on Ukraine and then, and then and, and Glazer on, on, on Gaza, you know, be proud of this war, be ashamed of that war, both of which, both wars, the US is up to its neck in paying for, it's underwriting both. And then, you know, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Nothing but clap, apparently. So what was once a semi-coherent narrative, a narrative of wokeness and, and, and more besides, has demonstrably fallen apart. And that's why, I mean, although the Oscars are, are trivial by definition, they are the definition of trivial, they, but, but a truth therein, And you can see there how wokeness, which has had such an effect on life, full stop, it is falling apart. Or this iteration of wokeness, 
I mean, there were so many, but wrestler turned actor and rapper John Cena, poor big soul, he somehow or other was persuaded to come on stage naked, at least apparently naked. He was wearing one of those flesh-coloured sort of G-string things um, to, to present the gong for best costume. He, was, he had the envelope like, held over his, you know, special place. Um, but he, he, he looked naked. But it also looked for all the world like some sort of choreographed humiliation. It, it looked like they were doing that to him. Like, like, the, like the hazing that the, that the Marines apparently go through in, in the US or or the initiation into some sort of secret society. You know, it looked like a deliberate humiliation of a human being. But the crowd clapped and cheered and laughed and, and so on. And he played the naked fool. And so, you know, I ask, honestly, I've always, always like this. And I just didn't know it. You know, I just didn't notice. You know, was I, was I just watching the same and not seeing it for what it was? Or has it changed? I, I ask that sincerely. You know, there's been times before when we've been encouraged, told anecdotally, to consider Hollywood as some sort of latter-day Babylon. Uh, you, you know, the Hollywood Babylon is that book from the 50s or the 60s, or, and it was all about, you know, decadence and degeneracy in the Hollywood of the 1920s. Um, you know, much of it disavowed and, you know, debunked and whatever, whatever, whatever. But, but we've had, well, from time to time, we've had more of the same about Hollywood. And other times, Hollywood has been unbelievably preachy and moralising and holier than thou. Celebs going up to get their awards and using the speech to, you know, tout politics and you know, do as I say and not as I do. Maybe it's just me and, it, and a product of what I've been paying attention to in recent years, but I'd say the Oscars has, have never been harder to watch than now. And it's not just the Oscars. I, I I think about you know I don't know if you if, if people watching this have seen the Hunger Games, but you know the you know in the Hunger Games you know there's this there's this obscene contrast between the the the, the hyper rich with their powdered wigs and their elaborate costumes in an auditorium watching celebrating the Hunger Games with poor people are in a gladiatorial combat to the death just for entertainment, just for the just for the entertainment of the super rich. And it, it, increasingly, the, so much of what we're being shown now feels like that, you know, this elite that are celebrating themselves and each other at the cost of the rest of us. And we've been invited to look on at it and our noses are being rubbed in it. So I watched the glitz and the gold and the glamour of the Oscars, you know, the, all the opulence and the excess and the... the the dresses and the, all the buffed up, varnished flesh, not just John Cena's, obviously. And, and I considered the emptiness of it all and the baseness of it all, as it struck me, and the insincerity of the words. And I found the stuff of bread and circuses all but overwhelming. So I say again, ask again, was it always like this? And I was just too distracted to notice. I, I don't know. I fear it might be that. But I honestly don't know. What I do know is this, if like me, you can no longer bear to watch the pantomime, and not just the Oscars, but if you can no longer bear to watch the pantomime because you see the strings and you see the shadows lurking in the wings and, and you, you, you've noticed the, the, the one dimensional clapboard of the sets and the pan stick makeup on the, you know, dripping off the faces of bad actors, then you're not alone. If you can no longer bear to watch so much of what's going on around us, it's because none of it is worth watching anymore. <laughs>